So last time we were talk about the other measure. Okay, what was the other measure? I mean, let me just repeat this quickly, so because um, probably you can't follow this. Okay, so this is what we talked about last time. It was about dominant equals the other so the other measure. So the other measure function. Okay, you don't need to. You don't need to do this because um, it's quite. Actually, we've been talking about it before, so uh, you don't need that right now. Okay, so the other measure will be actually a function which is defined on the power set of the circle set. Okay, so this is the power set of omega, and uh, that goes from the power set uh, from from um, uh, the power set of omega to the set of mere numbers with three properties. Namely, the first property is that the image of the empty set is zero, which is actually the same as for measures as well. The second property is that the alpha measure is monotonic, meaning that you have the monotonicity property, namely that the measure of A is not greater than the measure of B, or let's say the other measure, okay, in case if A is a subset of B. And uh, the third property is the sigma subadditivity, okay, so sigma subadditivity, okay meaning that the, let's say, the image of a countable union of any arbitrary sequence of sets, okay, so you have arbitrary sets cannot be greater than the sum of the images, okay, so this is the property <coughs> that we were talking about, we refer it to as sigma subjectivity, okay, this is it, okay, so because the problem is that some 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 sets didn't have any measures, you know, which for instance some negligible sets, some measures were not complete in general from the length function on the ball algebra is not complete as we were showing that we were discussing that already. Okay? So that was a problem. So we we tried to find a different approach to actually to make the measures complete in general. So this is how we do it by defining the so-called other measure. And then we also define the Lebesgue other measure, remember that, okay? Here, okay, so this is what we were doing. That was the next definition, remember that, okay? So the Lebesgue, okay, French mathematician, Lebesgue other measure, okay? I tried to explain it this in detail. So the Lebesgue other measure is also a function I call lambda star. It's defined on the power set of a certain set omega. Okay, let's say, and that goes to the set of real numbers with the following property. Okay, so you have that the, actually that the, let's say the Lebesgue outer measure of a certain set, which, one, which is from the power set, okay, is the infimum, okay, or you can say the minimum, if you like, okay, but it's not precise. The infimum of the following expression, namely the infimum of the following sum, so from i is equal to 1 to plus infinity. So actually it is a smaller sum, let's say, okay? Right? So these are sets, okay, capital I are sets here, okay, which are moral sets, all right. But the property, and that's that's actually what I do, is actually that the set E for which the other measure should be defined is actually covered by the total union of these sets, okay? So this is how you do it. Okay, so the image or let's say the measure, so the, or the other measure will be the smallest sum of sets that cover the set that we're talking about. That's the definition. Okay? So I try to I try to illustrate it by using using a certain figure, you know, where we're drawing some kind of rectangles and you know trying to cover a certain area. And the smallest way to, to the total way to apply to to cover it would be actually the, the other measure as we did. Okay, so that would be, let's say, the smallest sum the machine are thinking for themselves. Go back. Okay, good. I'll put this for that. So, the smallest, let's say, the smallest sum of sets that cover the set of which we define the other measure. That would be, basically, that would be the back other measure, as you have seen probably. Last time. Okay, so this is that was the subject of last uh, of last week. Okay, now we go further because the problem is that 
the other measures are now not measures in general, since they may fail to be sigma additive, okay, so the efficacy, that was a problem that we were facing, and it is also true for the back other measures, so uh, I also summarized that as well, so that was the problem, okay, so that's why we, where we start today, okay, so the back, uh, outer measures, outer measures are no measures in general, okay, why is that? Because they fail to be, in general, they fail to be sigma in most cases, okay? Because they may fail to be sigma additive, okay? Okay? So what does sigma additivity mean? Sigma additivity mean, mean, means actually that the image of a countable union of these pairwise and these joint sets, I forgot to, to mention that last week, so pairwise and these joint sets, the image of a countable union of pairwise and these joint sets is equal to the sum of the image of the number, okay, and that is not true in general. Okay, so now we try to find a, actually an approach to make, act, to define or to create a measure from other measures, okay, which will be relatively easy, as you will see, and this new measure will be complete, okay? And that's that's the goal for today, so this is what we do now. So how do we solve the problem that we actually have here, okay? So, and the other problem is that uh, measures are not complete in general because you remember the negligible sets, okay? So some negligible sets, which are subsets of null sets, are not measurable, okay? We were, we've seen this, for instance, for subsets of the Canvas set last time, okay? We were talk, talking about that. So, okay, guys, now, that's the, actually, the approach is, relatively simple, okay? So you don't have to leave this, but anyway, so let me define a new new other measure, okay? So basically, this is gonna be a new definition, okay? So we have a new function, and the new function will be called uh, Kata Theodori measure, okay? So what we have is another measure, so let lambda, okay, and lambda will be sorry, will be an other measure, okay? So we'll uh, denote a, an other measure, okay? The German other measure, you say, voice of mass, okay? Just for you to know, okay? So, and we have then the, then the function lambda, or the set, let's say a set from the power set of omega, okay, is called, check it out, Kata Theodori. Okay. okay. Kata Theodori measurable. Okay, so a set is called Caratelori measurable if okay the following property is satisfied and namely for all subsets okay of omega. So this is only okay so the let's say the image of A shall be equal to the image of the intersection of A and E, right? Plus the image of the difference of A and E. And namely Okay, let me add this for all A from the power set of omega. Okay. So A is, a, a is actually something from the power set of omega. Okay. And if all sets, all right, satisfy this property, okay, so all sets, this property here, okay, for all, basically, okay, so that's important. So that property must be true for all. Then the set E, okay, so this is what we're talking about here. The set E is called Karateodori measurable. Okay, so the set E is Karateodori measurable if this property is satisfied for all sets from the power set of omega. Okay, so this is actually where the sets are. Okay? That is also an indirect definition, but that may say this a little bit. So where it does actually this equation come from, let me illustrate that for us, okay, so, oh, goddammit, 
This is, yeah, this is a feature, okay? The machine won't, won't even listen. All right, anyway. Okay, so this is, let me say, let me illustrate this. Okay, so let's say you have, uh, here you have set a, uh, set a, and this is the set B, all right? And for instance, what you see here is this. Okay, so here, this set here, this one, Okay, in the middle. This is the intersection of A and B. All right. And this set here, that one. Okay, I'm using a different color because I like to choose you. This set, okay, is actually the difference of A and B. Okay. And if you have a measure, for instance, the probability measure. All right. Okay. So, for instance, or any other measure. I mean, that is also true here. You can see that clearly. That, for instance, the or anything else that the set A is actually a union of the two, okay? So you have the difference of A and B, okay? And the intersection of A and B, and if you unify the two, then you get the set A. You see this, okay? Now, let's say, for instance, you have a measure. So in that case, suppose that, uh, okay? Suppose that, let's say, U is a measure, okay? In that case, you can have that the measure of, of the set A will be equal to the measure of the union here on the, on the right. Now, since the measure is sigma additive, which means that the <coughs> image of a union is equal to the sum of the images, okay, remember, okay, actually by definition, so in that case, you have that the image of this union is equal to the, uh, to the sum of the images, right? So that's actually where this equation that you see above, okay, come from because this is something, this is a property that all measures have, okay, basically, you see, all right, you see this, okay, so if two sets are equal, then they also have equal measures, that's quite obvious, and if, let's say you have the, the image of A, in that case, must be also the image of the union, so since the measure is actually sigma additive, then you have that the image of the union is equal to the sum of the images here in that case. All right? So this is actually a property that measures have. Now, and if you say that, let's say, we define a certain set with which all, my, all sets satisfy actually this property, then we call the set counter board measure. Well, this is it. Okay? So, but we don't have a measure here. We have, a, so we have an outer measure. Okay? So lambda here is an outer measure. Okay? So it is not sigma additive in general. Okay, in general. All right, but at least you know, at least if that property is satisfied, then we call the set character Lorentz measurable. You understand? Okay. So basically, that is just you know a property that can be satisfied. Okay, it's not you know you don't have a kind of union here. So basically, this is just a finite union. Anyway, so if that property is true for that, then we obtain actually a new function and we call the set E for which this equation is satisfied actually current the lower measure. All right guys. Okay, so this is the illustration. Okay? Now with that property you can actually show that the family of all Karatadori measurable sets constitutes a sigma algebra. And this proof is relatively long. Okay, so I'm not going to illustrate this, okay? It is about, let's say, five or six pages, okay? Which is relatively large, trust me, okay? So if you have a proof that is longer than, let's say, one or two pages, then you spend like a whole week, you know, to even to understand what it is about. And uh, if you really want to understand this, I mean, you can look it up, okay? Give you the literature. But, um, I have to skip that here, so um, because it's very long. Okay, so basically, but that is a very important uh, statement. So the family of all category measurable sets. Okay, so we take they take all sets for which for which this equation is actually satisfied. Okay, right, and we collect them, and this collection of sets constitutes a sigma algebra. Okay, and any set that is defined.
Okay, so basically that's very important. So the family, okay, so the family, you know what a family is, a set of subjects, right? So the family of all kara theodori, measurable sets, okay? Sets constitutes, okay, constitutes a sigma algebra, okay. That is important, okay. Again, let me read this because it looks kind of weird. So, the family of all kind of theory measurable sets constitutes a sigma algebra. What does it mean? Well, it means that when you take all sets for which your character theory measurability is probably satisfied, we collect them and we put them in the sigma algebra and we can show that actually this, and we, we can, so, sorry, we put them in the family and uh, we actually can show that this family will constitute the sigma algebra after that, okay? On actually over the set on which is the, the subsets are actually. Okay guys, now the corresponding alpha, alpha measure is also a measure, you know, so if let's say you have that the corresponding alpha measure Okay, so basically this is the second one. All right, so the second property is that the corresponding alpha measure on the sigma algebra constitutes the measure. Okay, so the the corresponding the corresponding alpha measure on this sigma algebra also constitutes. A measure, okay. Now that is also quite long, okay. So actually, basically, you have to show that the the function is sigma additive, okay. And that's just by achieving that, and that's a sensation actually. But just demanding that property here, okay. So basically, you would get that the function would be also sigma additive, point blank period just by that property, okay? That, that is also very interesting, okay, basically. But it's, first it's relatively difficult, and second it's relatively long, so we don't have time for that, but you should actually keep that in mind. So that's basically how we approach this, okay? Now I'm gonna show you the third one, because that's quite easy to understand, and I hope you also understand this well. So we will show that actually this measure is complete, okay? All right, so I'll show you that this measure is complete, okay? And I do this by the following, so if a set, okay, so we'll just write it down, so if a set has the other measure zero, okay? A set has the outer measure zero, okay, then any of its subsets are null sets, all right? <coughs> okay, so all subsets of it are null sets, which means that they have actually the measure zero in that sense, okay? And the sets are, and the sets are caratteridori measurable, okay? Okay, so they satisfy actually, they satisfy actually the property that by which the, the category measure, meta measure was defined. Okay, now that is something that I would like to prove here. Okay, so we prove this right away, but we don't prove the other two. Okay, so the proofs for, for the first two are omitted. Okay, and basically this means that the measure is complete. In that sense, okay. So the corresponding Lebesgue Lebesgue alpha measure with the character door prop uh, property will be complete, and that's that's actually the final proof for that, okay. And that is also true for any other alpha measure, not just the Lebesgue alpha measure, but also for the other measures as well. Okay. Now, okay, guys. So let's let's try to prove this. Okay. So that will be the proof. Okay. So basically, what you do is this. Okay. So. So define, let's, let's uh, actually, you say, you have n prime, okay? So, and uh, 
suppose that m prime is actually a subset of n, and that the let's say that the image of n is equal to zero. So a lambda is of course an alpha measure. Okay, so lambda is an outer measure. Okay? And the set n has the outer measure zero. Okay? You understand? Okay? Now I want to show you two things here first. Okay, so the first thing we need to show, okay, so first we show that okay that uh, so basically the outer measure of n prime is also zero. Okay, so if, let's say and that is not true for all subsets of so null sets in terms of measures. You know, you remember that. For instance, the length function is the subset of the Cantor set. Okay, so that was not true here. Okay, so in this case, we show that that's the first one, and the second one um, of the second part of the proof will be that we show that um, that n prime is Karatelduri measurable. Okay, that's it. Okay, so this is actually what the proof is about. Okay, two parts. Again, let me say this. First, we show that the image of any, let's say, negligible set is zero, okay, which is a subset of the null set, right? And the second part will be that the Karatelduri measure is also satisfied. So that property is satisfied. Okay, I'm going to show that to you. Okay, so basically this is what we have. All right. Okay, now let's actually let's actually uh, continue. Okay, so that will be the proof. Now, first off, why is that actually the, that the first first statement directly follows from the definition? So what we have is let me just let me illustrate this again. So we have n prime, which is a subset of n, and uh, we also have that the outer measure of n is equal to zero. Now, wh why is that? Why does directly imply that the actually that the upper measure of the set n prime, which is a subset of set, is actually also zero? And that is rather easy because okay, so because basically the outer measure is sigma sub additive. What does that mean again? Okay, so this is actually a direct implication and it's quite trivial. Now the question is why is that? Because remember what sigma additivity means? Sub additivity, sorry. So sigma sub additivity means that the union of or the image of a union, okay, of set uh, two sets, let's say, cannot be greater than the sum of the images. Alright? You understand? Okay? So I mean in the first place, I mean the monotonicity property actually states that the, okay, so due to monotonicity, okay, so and monotonicity, okay, so the, uh, due to the monotonicity property, we have that the image, or the outer image of that set cannot be greater than that, okay, okay, that's basically the first First implication, so no matter where actually what the outer measure of this set n prime would be, it cannot be greater than that. Okay, so it's either zero or negative. But the thing is this, okay, so due to the sigma additivity property, let's say we have that for and suppose, let's say, suppose that uh, okay, so let's say if n prime is a subset of n, that let's say that um, and the union of n prime and m so so for certain set is equal to is equal to let's say n, and that these two sets are disjoint. Okay, so in that case, you would also have that the then the image of this union, okay, cannot be greater than the sum of the images. Okay. All right. Now here in that case, M is also a subset of that, so since that is also true here for two subsets, okay, we are, that equation would only hold if actually both subsets have the zero measures. The out, zero outer measures in that case, we would conclude that due to the sub additivity property, and because of that, because since can, this cannot be greater than, you see that here, okay, so this is due to the monotonicity property, cannot, this cannot be greater than the measure of that which is actually zero. This equation can always be satisfied if the two 
okay, are zero, and that is also true for a countable union. Okay, so for a countable union, if that is true, the actually the sum of these, some uh, the, the image of these sums, uh, the sums actually must be also equal to zero as well. Okay, so then this implies automatically that the other image of that set must be also zero. Okay, now second, and that's the second property we have. We show that it is character door measurable. Now, okay, so we show that this is character door measurable. So that was the first part, and then that's okay. So this is the first part, okay, and that's the second part. Now, how do we show that the sets are okay? So n are n primes, okay? So these n primes are character door measurable. So how do we show it? Okay. So first off, we have that we find, figure out that the upper image of that set is equal to zero, and uh, in that case, you have also that since basically, okay, so let's say a certain n a set uh, the intersection of n uh, of a set set A, sorry, and n prime, okay, is a subset of n prime, okay. So for any and that means that in this case, for any set A, we have that the image of the intersection of n of A and n prime must be also equal to zero. Okay. That's the first thing that we figure out. Okay. So, if let's say the image of n prime is zero, then we automatically have that the image of the intersection of any set from the Okay, so from the power set of lambda, n n prime must be also equal to zero because n, n, the intersection is also a subset of n prime. Okay, so this is basically um, basically the other statement. Okay, so that is a subset, so that must be also having the outer measure zero. Okay, because it's a subset of that. So any subs any subset of the of a yeah, of a set that has zero image is also having a uh, the image of zero. Okay. Now, guys, we have the following. Okay. So basically, we have, and that's the first part. Okay. So secondly, and we also have that. Okay. So the let me illustrate this. So that the image. Okay. Of the difference of any set and n prime cannot be greater than the the image. Of the set A, and why is that? Because of the sub-additivity property as well. Okay, you have seen this in the diagram. Let me illustrate this here. Okay, so suppose that this is a set A. Okay, and that is a set, let's say n prime. All right. Okay. So probably you see it better. Okay, so actually the area here of this set. Okay, cannot be greater than the area of this set here. Okay, which is a difference. Okay, let me just say this. So this is a set A. That's a set A. And uh, that is a difference. Okay, you understand? This is the difference of the sets A and M prime. Okay? So let's say the area of the red, of, of the red area, let's say, it cannot be, cannot be less than the the orange one, okay? Due to the sub additivity property as well. Okay? You got that? But that's not the only thing, okay, so that we, we can have, I mean, we have here. I mean, basically, we also have that the, let's say the outer image of A cannot be also greater than the sum of these two, okay? Maybe the, the intersection, okay? of A and N prime and the okay, let me just wait a minute. The editor is going crazy. Okay, so we go back. So basically this is this is the first statement that I can make here. Okay, so the actually the orange array cannot be greater than the red one, and the second second is that the area here of this function cannot be greater than the sum of these because also that is also true of the sub-additivity property of the other measure. Okay, so 
Let me just finish that, okay? And that's what we have here, okay? So basically, the subadditivity property says, I mean, this is what we what we also can, can see, okay? So A is equal to the actually to the union of the intersection of A and A and prime, sorry, and the difference of A and N prime, as we have seen this in the picture above, remember? Mm -hmm. Okay? And due to the subadditivity property, okay, so due to to sigma subadditivity. This means that actually the image of that that set, which is a union of that, cannot be greater than the sum of the images. Okay, so the image of that set, okay, cannot be greater than the sum of the images of the two. Okay, and that is due to the subadditivity property as well. Okay, so basically what we have here is this. Okay, so that's the same statement as well. All right. Now this is what the subadditivity is about, guys. Okay, so this means that the image of the union cannot be greater than some of the images, okay, basically. So, and si so we actually combine the two statements here. So what I'm doing here is this. I'm combining that statement with that one, okay? So let me just summarize that, okay? So we have basically that the, okay, so basically that the image of the difference of A and N prime is not greater than the image of A, which is also not greater than, okay, so that's where it, it continues to so the image. The image of A and N prime plus the image of the difference of A and N prime. Okay, so this is actually the inequality that we obtained here from these two statements. And that is due to the sigma additivity property of the other measure. So I didn't use anything like, you know, the Sigma additivity property, nothing, nothing like that was actually required here. So now we figured out that this here, this image here, is actually zero. Remember that? So that was equal to zero. So basically, since that it was equal to zero, we have that the following inequality holds. So the the image of the difference, okay, cannot be greater than the image of A which cannot be greater than the image of the difference. You see this? Okay. All right. So the image of the difference cannot be greater than the image of A, and this cannot be greater than the image of the difference. Now, that is only true, this green inequality is only true if these two are equal, you see? Because otherwise, if, if two, these two are not equal, then this will not be true because that two are equal. So these two, these two sides of the inequality are equal, Okay, so if that's the case, then the image of that must be equal to the image of the difference. You understand? Okay? So in this case, we figure out that the image, okay, so the image of the difference must be equal to the, actually, to the image of A, obviously. All right? Now, since this equation holds, and we also have that, you know, that the image of the intersection was equal to zero. It doesn't change that, and this also implies that you can have you have the image of A here on the right hand side, and you have that the intersection, okay, so A and N prime plus the image of the difference is also equal to that because that is equal to zero, right? You understand? Okay? So if that is equal to zero, it doesn't change anything, guys, in this equation. Now, and that is true for all, okay, so you have that this is true for all, for all sets of the power set of omega, okay, so let me write it like this, so the power set of omega, okay. So that's the proof, so here we actually, we figure out that hence, the, the set n prime is Karatadori measurable. Okay. And that's it. Okay. See? That was relatively easy. Okay. But I tried to explain a little bit more detail. Okay, guys. That was it. So, this property is actually enough to generate, to, 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 to generate the measure from the other measure. Okay? And um, 
let me just summarize that. Okay, so that's actually what the Lebesgue measure is. Okay, so suppose that you have the Lebesgue auto measure, and if the Lebesgue auto measure satisfies, or for certain sense, satisfy also the, let's say, the Caratodori property, then this measure automatically will become, this auto measure, sorry, will automatically become a measure as well, so we call it this, uh, the Lebesgue measure. Okay, so we define this as the, to be the Lebesgue measure, so definition. Okay. Okay. The back measure. Okay, what is that? Okay, so the the back outer measure, which was lambda star, right, is called the back measure. Okay. If it satisfied, it satisfies the Cara Theodori measurability. Okay? The Cara Theodori if it satisfies the Cara Theodori measurability, okay? All right, so that's that's how the Lebesgue alpha measure can be actually defined. Okay, in that case. So, and the corresponding sets are called Lebesgue measurable. So we have that as well. Okay, so the corresponding sets sets are called Lebesgue. Measurable. Okay. Ooh. That's it. Okay. Now, basically, the, the most difficult part of the proof would be I mean, the proof is not complete. Okay. In that sense, that because I didn't show you that the corresponding sense of the current and measurable sense constitutes the sigma algebra. Okay. And the corresponding auto measure constitutes a measure on that sense. Okay. So, basically, that is what the proof was lacking, but you have to trust me in that sense that this is how it is constructed, okay? Now, of course, we can actually say that the Lebesgue measure is complete, okay? So in that sense, because all negligible sets are measurable sets and they have to measure zero, okay? So this is actually it, but still, okay, there are still some problems, okay? so. Uh, let me just summarize that here. Okay, so the cardinality. Okay, so the cardinality of the Lebesgue measurable sets is equal to that of the power set of the wheels. Okay, so the cardinality. The cardinality. Cardinality of the Lebesgue measurable sets of the family of the Lebesgue measurable sets, let's say, uh, of the set, sorry, of the set of Le the Lebesgue measurable sets is equal to that of the power set of the real numbers. Okay, so this is equal to 2 to the power of LF1. Remember, so the cardinality of the real numbers was LF1, so this is 2 to the power of LF1, so this is just as large as the power set of the real numbers. Okay, yes? Could you read that? Yes. Again, so the cardinality of the set of the Lebesgue measurable sets, okay, so the set of Lebesgue measurable sets is equal to 2 to the power of LF1, and LF1 is the cardinality of the set of real numbers, we already discussed that, okay? So this is just as large as the power set of the real numbers, okay? However, there are some, still some problems, okay, with that, because there are sets which are even not Lebesgue measurable, for instance, the so-called Vitaly set, okay, so that's the that is actually the next theory, okay? I'm gonna tell you what it is, okay? So 
basically that's going to be an Ethereum. Okay, I'm going to tell you what the Bitcoin set is. Okay, so there are still, although it's going to be okay. So the power set of the real number, so the, the coordinate of the power set of the real number is equal to that of the measured number of the set. So that might suggest that actually all sets are the back measurable, but still there is a possibility under certain circumstances to even to construct sets which do not have a the back measure. And I'm going to tell you about it. I'm going to tell you about it here. So uh, so-called Bitcoin sets even. Uh, a Vitaly set, okay, I'm going to tell you what it is, if it exists, that's not certain, okay, trust me, so if it exists, okay, so if it exists, is not Lebesgue measurement. Okay, now I'm going to tell you what the set is. Okay, so this is a highly abstract set that only exists under certain circumstances, namely under the circumstance that the so-called axiom of choice holds. Okay, maybe you heard of that or something like that. This is going to be also a topic for a seminar, so I'm not going to talk about that. Okay, so what the axiom of choice is. Okay, because maybe somebody is taking a topic, so if, if you should decide to take, uh, to take a topic, um, and I don't want to ruin your presentation in that sense, okay? So what is actually a written set? And this is what I would like to talk about now. So what is a written set? Okay, so what we do is this, okay? So I use it as an example, okay? So suppose that we define a relation on R, okay? So let, this is the notation, okay? So the tail of let denote, denote a relation. On the set of real numbers, okay. And uh, I define the relation as follows, okay. So two elements are, or if two <coughs> elements have a relation between the two elements relate to each other, okay. If and only if the difference of the two elements is rational, okay. So two elements relate to each other if the difference of the element is rational. No, guys, just because, okay, so even if you have two irrational numbers, okay, then the difference of two irrational, strictly irrational numbers can be rational. Let me just illustrate this. For instance, you have the, let's say, the logarithm of 5,000, okay, 2 base 10 minus the logarithm of 5 to base 10. So these two Actually, for instance, okay, so these two are not rational numbers, right? Okay, so this, what is actually logarithm of 5,000 to base 10? This is actually the exponent of the power that equals 5,000 to base, where the base is actually 10. So 10 to the, 10 to the what equals 5,000? That's it. And the answer is logarithm of 5,000 to base 10. All right? Now, these two are irrational, but as you can see this here, so the logarithm of that minus the logarithm of that, so the logarithm of the differences equals, uh, sorry, the difference of logarithms equals the ratio, the logarithm of the ratio, so this will be equal to the logarithm of 5,000 over 5 to base 10. Now 5,000 to be, uh, over 5 equals 1,000, so the logarithm of 1,000 to base 10 equals 3, remember? Okay, so you're looking at me like, what the hell, remember? 10 to the power of 3 equals 1,000, guys. Okay? Good. Now, so you see that just because you have two irrational numbers, it doesn't mean that the difference cannot be rational as well. So, of course, 3 is the rational number. Okay? So this is not an irrational number, guys. This is not a rational number. So that one is not a rational number. That one is not either, but the difference is. Okay? So that can be the case. So these two numbers relate to each other. And what does it mean? That mean that they are in the same equivalence class. I forgot to mention namely that this equation, okay, so this relation is then this relation is an equivalence relation. Remember what an equivalence relation was? What was that? Three properties, remember? For the exam, what are the three properties of equivalence relations? 
reflexivity, symmetry, and transitivity. Reflexivity means what? That each element relates to what? To itself. Okay? Why is that? Because you can see this here, so like it easily. X minus Y, so X minus X is always equal to zero, so X minus X is equal to zero, and root zero is a ratio number, so any number also relates to itself, right? So and if X minus Y is rational, then Y minus X is also rational, because it's just, just, it's just a negative, so one, of, one is a negative of the other, so in that case, the relation is also symmetric, and the ratio, the relation is also transitive, so if X minus Y is, is a rational number, then Y minus Z is also a rational number, then X minus Z must be also a rational number. Okay, so that is something that we can show, but I'm not doing this, okay? That's quite obvious here in that sense. So in this case, we have a so-called equivalence relation, which means that we have equivalence classes. Remember, what, was, well, what were equivalence classes here in that case? Which property do they have, remember? Remember that? So equivalence classes generate what? A partition, all right? on the set on which the relation is defined. Okay, so we have a partition of the set of the numbers through that. Okay, so because these two guys here, that one, for instance, and that one, they are in the same equivalence class, remember? Okay? It's not that long ago, guys. Okay? You should not, you're still not supposed to forget this. Okay, so they are in the same equivalence class, and others are also in the same equivalence class. Okay? Basically, all natural numbers in the same equivalence class because the difference of two natural numbers is actually also a natural no uh, actual rational number. So in that case, and this is also true for rational numbers as well. So all rational ratio numbers are all also in the same equivalence class. Anyway, so we have a partition of the set of real numbers, right? So and now we do what? Okay, so because I define a bit of the set. Okay, so we have each equivalence class. Okay, and we select one representative out of each equivalence class, okay? And now we collect these, uh, every equivalence class on the set of real numbers, okay? And this set that will contain the representative of each and every equivalence class will be the so-called Vitali set, okay? So that's what, you, what we're doing, okay? So then, of course, this is an equivalence collation such that it generates, okay, so such that that it generates a partition of the set of real numbers by means of its equivalence classes, okay? Of its equivalence classes. Equivalence classes of, of a certain element of classes, or let's say, or, uh, or sets of elements, let's say, it's, for instance, equivalence class of X contains all elements to which number X relates to, okay? So for instance, I mean, what would be the equivalence class of the logarithm of 5,000 to base 10 that would, that would constitute all elements, actually, that relate to that number, for instance, that one as well, okay? So remember that, okay? Now, what we do is, uh, I mean, with the following. So we select for every equivalence class that we have, okay? We select a single element, okay? So and then, okay, then the set, okay? Then the set, remember, so I call it capital B, all right? Which should be a subset from this interval containing exactly one representative from each equivalence class is called the Vitali set. So we're looking at an interval from 0 to 1, okay? And uh, we collect actually the representatives from each equivalence class, okay? So, but provided that the representatives are from between 0 and 1, okay?
Okay, so that's the only requirement that we have. And now we select these representatives. Now the question is how would we select these representatives? And, and that, is, that is a question which is not relatively easy to answer. And the way of selecting it is by requiring that the so-called axiom of choice is true. Okay, so this will be about the so-called axiom of choice. So, but if the axiom of choice is not true, so this requirement it is not hold, then the bit of the set would not exist. So in that sense, in that sense, this since that set not would not exist, it didn't, didn't need to be actually measurable. Okay, so we actually there is a proof in the election rules. So I proved that the Vitaly set is not measurable, okay? So, which is not, okay, so V is not measurable, okay? That's, that's what we have here, in that sense, okay? If it exists, provided it exists, okay? And that relates to the axiom of choice, so that is a seminar topic which I don't want to take away, so I'm not going to talk about that, and I don't want to prove why the bit of the set is not measurable if it exists. Okay? So if it exists, it's not measurable. It's very interesting, the proof is not difficult, so maybe you have time to read this. Okay? But um, it's not very important for us. Okay? Okay, so maybe someone who is choosing that topic can talk about it that, okay, by his or her own, all right, I don't want to take that topic away, okay, guys, now, as I mentioned before, this is the existence of, of such set, namely the Bitterly set, relates to the so-called axiom of choice, but we're not going to elaborate on that, okay, so we're going to start with the so-called, with the next topic, and this will be about congruence, okay, so this is chapter number four, I think, is that, no, five, sorry, this will be chapter number five. So this will be about confidence. Okay. Now actually what is a sequence? And I'm gonna define what a sequence is, okay? So for instance, an example for a sequence, the Fibonacci sequence, okay? Maybe you heard of that, okay? The Fibonacci sequence goes like this, okay, so the first element of the sequence will be 1, the second will be 1, next will be 2, 3, 5, 8, 13. You understand the principle? How does it go? That's an intelligence test, guys. Sometimes you see in a job interview, you have like, you know, you get some kind of sequence. 21. Okay, 21, you all right? Uh, 34. Yeah, okay, you got it. So actually the... The next element is always the sum of the previous two, right? You see? So 1 plus 1 equals 2, 1 plus 2 equals 3, 2 plus 3 equals 5, 5 plus 8 equals 13, 8 plus 13 equals 21, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so this is the Fibonacci sequence. Now, okay, so that would be the first element, right? So this is the first element, this is the second element, 